Yeah, so um, I'm Lisa, I'm a librarian here at Pima College, and uh, today we're gonna talk about late 19th century fashion. Uh, so let's get started. Thank you for coming, everyone. I really appreciate you attending. Okay, so um, I recently had a book published called Everyday Fashion and Found Photographs, American Women of the Late 19th Century. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about how that book came about. Um, and then I'm gonna whiz you through six decades of fashion um, it, as seen in photographs of just everyday people. Um, and along the way, we're gonna throw in a little bit of history and I'm hoping by the end, you'll be able to spot what decade fo which photo came from based on the fashion. So when you're watching a movie or you're watching television, you'll be able to be like, yeah, that's 1860s. Okay, so, um, I wrote the book um, at, because I have been collecting photographs for, well, probably over a decade. And what I collect are old, mostly 19th century, early 20th century photographs. This came about because before I came to Pima, I worked as an archivist at a couple of different institutions, um, one of which was British Vogue. So I was there for almost a decade looking after their photograph collection. And while I was there, I just fell in love with fashion photography. Um, I realized that not only was it you know, artistic and creative, but it also really reflected the time in which it was done. The clothes kind of give you an idea of the types of people and what their, their lives were like. Um, so I, I kind of fell in love with that. And um, also, the photographs, influence each other. So I wanted to show you two photographs from the British Vogue archives. One is by a, a, a British photographer called Cecil Beaton. It's of Winston Churchill's daughter and it was from a piece he did called Land Girls where he photographed women during the Second World War who were working the land um, basically producing food for Britain during the war. Um, decades later Another photographer who is a very famous fashion photographer called Tim Walker, um, he was in love with Cecil Beaton's work and he actually did just kind of a, a, a direct copy of the Land Girls shoot um, and then this was the result. So even though something might seem of the past, it can really pull itself into the present and be meaningful in the present too. So after I left Vogue, um, I missed those photos because I'd been taking care of them for many years. I, I, I missed the collection. So what I did is I started my own collection of teeny tiny photos and just started buying them. Every time I went to a junk store or an antique store, I would look for pictures of women, usually unidentified, um, that had nice clothes on and then I would buy them. They're much more expensive now, but I used to be able to buy them for like a dollar or two dollars. This was my very first one. She was the one who got me addicted to this, this habit. And um, it was just because she's so beautiful and her dress just looks so perfect on her um, that I just needed to have more. So what I did is I researched her and all my other photographs, mostly using original um, sources or, or primary sources. So I don't know if you know, but women's fashion magazines from the middle of the um, 19th century all the way up till, well, pretty much the 1920s are all online for free. So you can look at them for free. So I would read the magazines, I would look at the clothing, and since most of these women were unidentified, the, the photos were undated, I would be able to date the photos based on what I was seeing in the magazines. Keeping in mind that sometimes women wear clothes for three or four years, so I was really dating the fashions rather than dating the photographs because who knows how old this dress was, but I could tell that this dress was fashionable in 1863, so that's what I dated it from. All right, so while I was doing my research, I looked for books to help me out, um, and there wasn't the kind of book that I wanted which would identify the different types of clothing, say about when they dated from, and then also tell you how they kind of related to the time period. So I just wrote my own, and it took quite a while, but it, got, it was published last November by Bloomsbury Publishing, and uh, if you wanna see a copy of it, there's one here. You can also borrow a copy from the Pima Libraries. Okay, so we're gonna start um, in the 1840s with our trip through fashion in the late 19th century. Um, the 1840s fashion was really influenced by a movement called Gothic Revival. 
and basically it was a time when there were there were there were there was financial difficulties there was a lot of sickness going around pandemics that sort of thing and it was kind of a gloomy era <laughs> and of course she looks very gloomy and sad as well but her clothes are influenced by um, the, the clothing of the original Gothic period. So you can see her bodice is like a tube. It's very straight down and very low and everything is tight, tight, tight. And her hair is kind of swooping down over her ears. So this um, kind of reflects the original Gothic period um, at the end of the Middle Ages and um, also the early Renaissance. So that's what influenced this. Now people often look at these old photos. These photos, the reason I'm starting here is Th these photos, these daguerreotypes, of which this is one, they were the first commercially successful photographic process. So this decade, the 1840s, is where you start seeing women in photographs because it, this is when, when it became widely popular to go to a photography studio and have your photograph taken. And people wonder, why do they always look so miserable? Does anyone have any idea why they look so miserable? Yeah, that's the most that's the most likely reason that um, when they took the picture, they had they had to have the shutter of the camera open for quite a long time, like a minute or so, um, to actually let light in to take the picture. So that's one of the reasons that they really had to be still. And the photographer, I would think, I'm just guessing, would be encouraging them: don't laugh, don't smile, just stay still, because otherwise these are one-offs. You would ruin the plate if you laughed or or moved around. And you do see a lot of them where it's blurry because someone moved for some reason, especially children. Um, so that's one of the reasons. I had a daguerreotype expert uh, talk to me a couple of weeks ago, and he said another reason was bad teeth. People were embarrassed by their teeth. And another reason is that people thought that they might look stupid if they smiled. So I thought those were interesting things I'd never heard before. But another thing is, uh, to keep in mind is that it was in fashion to be serious, to be sort of fragile as a woman. So this um, quote from A Manual of Politeness, it's an etiquette book from that period, says that women who were pale and interesting had a soft style of beauty that appeals to our most delicate perceptions. So they wanted women to be sort of delicate and um, very serious and, and pure and, and sweet. All right, so moving on to the 1850s. Um, this was the Romantic Movement, and the Romantic Movement influenced uh, philosophy and sociology and art and music and it, it was it was completely different although these two periods overlap I shouldn't make it sound so simple but um, they overlapped and the the romantic period of which I think the fashions of the 1850s really reflect it um, it was a time when sort of emotional sensitivity was valued and individuality and getting back to nature. Um, it was very romantic, that's, that's all I can say about it. Um, and the, the clothing reflects that. It was flowery, it was ruffly, the women wore sort of lacy collars and lacy undersleeves. And this quote shows kind of, uh, uh, it's from a woman's magazine and it kind of shows what people thought about it that dress is susceptible, as much distinct and passionate expression as music, dancing, painting, or all three combined. So basically, your fashion could reflect your sentiment um, and your sentimentality, really, and your emotions. All right, so my research, actually, I don't have many photos from the 1840s and 50s, and my book doesn't really start there either. It starts in the 1860s. And what happened in the 1860s? Yeah, the Civil War. So, of course, a huge upheaval, especially for, you know, in the United States. And um, it, in the 1840s and 50s, things were changing. Um, there was the Seneca Falls Convention, which was the first big women's rights convention um, in the United States. That happened. Um, lots of laws were puffed, passed that gave women more property rights, um, gave them the right not to be beaten up by their husbands. Uh, so things were getting better for women. What happened in the 1860s, which happens during wartime a lot, is that women really saw their duty. They had an important duty to maintain life on the home front. Uh, they, were, um, they were doing a lot of things their husbands used to do. So they took their position really seriously. They said they were there to restore the peace, de be teachers and exemplars of whatsoever, are so whatever, whatsoever things are pure, and do what they could to be for the good of their country and for the good of humanity. And so their clothing, 
let's see, oh, have I got it? Oh, I don't have that slide. Their clothing was a little bit simpler in the, um, in the 1860s. So they still had kind of the big sleeves and what we call the hoop skirt nowadays, but they didn't have the ruffles, the bows, the ribbons. It was much more simple. Things were difficult for women, especially in the South, um, in terms of their clothing. In the South, they had to make clothing out of um, something called factory cloth, which was really what they used to make underwear out of before. Homespun, which was um, homespun fabric. Um, they had to use natural dyes on their clothing when they made clothing, rather than having access to synthetic dyes, which were cheaper um, and were manufactured. And there was also um, women making clothing out of slave cloth, which there's a whole, if you want to do research on slave cloth, it's ver a very interesting topic that, that people who were enslaved had to make their clothing out of, out of a certain type of cloth, which was cheap and rough. Um, and there was a whole industry of, of, of people selling cloth to the South for, for the enslaved. Another thing, and I always, when I, I don't know how many of you have seen Gone with the Wind, but there's a famous scene where Scarlett O'Hara um, takes some curtains because she's so deprived of clothing. Um, she has to use the curtains to make her clothes. And you can see she's even got the curtain tassels as her belt. And I always thought that was not true. Like, you know, that was just for drama. It was true. I discovered in this woman's memoirs, my dress for the occasion was made of a pair of fine lace curtains that aunt sacrificed for the cause. So she was going to a ball, ball she needed a new dress, and they basically pulled the curtains off the, the windows and made her a dress. In the North, things were a little bit better. The home sewing machine um, was, was now being heavily marketed. Um, trade routes had opened across the country because the railroads had expanded. Um, and also Japan had opened up worldwide trade because it used to be a very closed in country. They opened up trade routes. Um, the textile mills, they couldn't make cotton, or, uh, they couldn't weave cotton because they didn't have access to cotton in the North, so they, they made wool instead, and people made wool. Um, and also, department stores first came into being, or they were around, but they really exploded, let's put it that way. Department stores became really popular, and this was good for everyday women who wanted to be in fashion. They would just, they could just go to a department store, browse without buying anything. They had big windows that displayed clothing. So things were a little bit better, but it was wartime, obviously. So I'm not trying to make out that things were easy for people in the North, but um, in terms of clothing, it was a little bit better for them. All right, so here are the differences. You can see that this one on the left is from the 1850s, ruffles. This one on the right is from the early 1860s. She still has the big sleeves, um, but her skirt is much more plain. Another big difference, so if you want to tell the difference between 1850s and 1860s um, clothing, this um, thing, which we call the hoop skirt now, was actually called the cage crinoline. Um, and the, the crinoline in the 1850s um, was kind of bell-shaped like the one on the left. The one on the right came into popularity sort of in the early 1860s, and it was elliptical shape. So it actually kind of had more um, volume on one side. So if you're looking at a photograph and you want to know, is it 1850s, or is it 1860s? 1850s will be more ruffly and have like a bell shape. 1860s will be an elliptical shape. And here's a picture of those. You can see the, the shape sticks out at the back. So that's how you know it's 1860s. And also the skirts are plain. These dresses were made in two parts. Um, they're just two matching parts that were attached together. And then the collar was detachable. And then the undersleeves also were detachable. So you could clean them easily. Another thing about the 1860s is that, as you would guess, it was very influenced by military design because um, they were fighting a war. So uh, there was the thing called the Garibaldi shirt, which was named after an Italian general um, where they had just a, a plain, what we would call a blouse now, but embroidered. So a woman could kind of express her individuality. There was the Zouab jacket, which was named after a regiment that had originally been in France, but both sides of the Civil War also used the Zouab name and adopted the jacket as their uniform. And then the one on the far right, you see she's just wearing military embellishments on her clothes. 
Another way that you can tell the 1850s from the 1860s is this little bonnet. They used to wear big funnels around their heads, um, which seems quite practical on a day like today, but uh, that went away pretty much altogether, in the, especially in the late 1860s. And women started wearing these cute little hats that were pe perched on their head. You can see the lady on the right, it's tied under her big chignon. She's got a ribbon that's kind of holding it underneath. Um, and, but it was kind of criticized by the popular press who said that it was a postage stamp with gr strings of green rib ribbons, the hair carefully combed back so as to give the air uninterrupted access to the roots and the ear and the neck. It's highly recommended by physicians, haha, ha, they're joking, a box of Scheffel's neuralgic ointment accompanies each bonnet. So in other words, these things are going to give you a headache because all this air is going to be going around your head. All right, and then in the late 1860s, the, the cage crinoline, that was starting to disappear. And you can see the ladies on the right, they no longer have a big cage up near their waist. It, 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 there's still one down at the bottom, you can see on the left. But at the waist, there was either no cage or just really tiny hoops. Um, and then on the right, you can see the change that in the, they were starting to layer clothing. So rather than just having a top and a skirt, it starts to get layered. So she on the right is wearing a little, um, what they call a chemisette, which is kind of a fake blouse underneath. And then on the, you can see on her skirt, she's got little panels, which were called panniers, which kind of come off, the, come off her waist and cover the sides of her hips. All right, so on to the 1870s. I always think of these clothing I don't know if ever, you got so many of you, the younger ones have probably never watched this, but anyone who's watched Bonanza, this kind of stuff, the Miss Kitty look, I think of as the 1870s. So it's lots of layers, um, you can tell that. There's always um, a long bodice, the, the fabric is draped all over the place. That little, um, what they call a crown braid on the head is also a big, big uh, indicator that something is 1870s. So in the 1870s, um, the Basque bodice came into fashion. So whereas before in the 1860s, the top was quite high on the waist, this is something that we would might call a peplum today. And that came into fashion in the 1870s and really lasted right almost up until the end of the 1870s. Um, I haven't talked too much about the photographs, but um, the first one I showed you was the daguerreotype. This is a tintype, which is similar. It's a one-off print. So the, the actual image is made in the camera, and then it's pulled out and then processed, and that's your photo. Um, earlier, let's see if we can find a, this one here on the left. These were called carte de visite. And they were basically what that means visiting card in English. And um, they were little tiny cards that people could um, either give people as mementos or if they were calling on someone or visiting they would give their card to say that they were in or they would often send them in the mail or they would um, yeah, just have photo albums just like people sort of did in the 20th century. Okay. Another thing that sort of identifies the 1870s is the, what, is, what are these women wearing on their back? Bustles. Yeah, the bustle. Um, at the time, it was actually called the tournure. Um, we call it the bustle today, but it was called the tournure. And uh, I, I never saw a bustle popularly used in the women's magazines of the 1870s. Um, so, but we'll call it the bustle because it's easier to say than tournure. Um, but you can see the, there's lots of fabric. Um, the tournure, or the bustle, look like that. So sometimes it was just tied around your waist and it was a bunch of steel hoops, just kind of like the hoop skirt, but just at, you know, at your back. Um, and sometimes it was part of the uh, drawers or the petticoat and it was kind of stuffed with horse hair. And then you'd basically have a dress that fitted over that and then multiple skirts that you hoiked up to kind of um, make it draped. So this period starts something in American history that we now call the Gilded Age. It was a time, it was post-war, so there was a, a boom in the economy. Uh, railroads, oil exploration, uh, minerals, people like Vanderbilt and uh, J.P. Morgan and um, Rockefeller, thank you. They all came in, um, were all making their millions at the time, or really this is when it started. So I think that the dress kind of reflects this opulence really. Also another huge factor was there, we, we saw the very first 
international fashion designer called Charles Worth. And literally everybody knew about him because fashion magazines were, easy, were widely distribute, distributed. Women shared them, they bought them in clubs so that they could pass them around. Um, so everybody knew who Charles Worth was and dressmakers across the country were copying his design. So actually clothing was quite consistent both across the US during the late 19th century and even across the ocean. We, you know, we, we weren't that far off what the Parisians and the Londoners were wearing. Charles Worth had been the, was the couturier to the Empress of France, so that's really where he um, gained his fame. But American women, again, things were opening up because it was the end of the Civil War. They could travel, they could take a boat across to Paris, order custom designs, but department stores also um, had, co had licensed copies of his, his designs. So his, his designs were everywhere. He brought in the bustle, actually. Pop popularly brought in the bustle. It was there before, but he made it popular. Another place that they could travel is, this was a huge event that happened in the 1870s. The first World Fair took place in Philadelphia, and there was a woman's pavilion. Women across the United States raised money to build this pavilion. This is a pattern company um, that had its own stand in the, in the um, exhibition. And it was called the New Century for Women. The, the building was called the Women's Building, and it, it, its theme was the New Century for Women. There were loads of William, women's colleges opening at that time. Uh, women were able to go to co-ed to men's colleges. They were starting to be able to study at men's colleges. Um, there was no, African Americans certainly didn't have anything approaching equality, but the first um, graduates from Harvard and Yale, men, graduated, um, African American graduates from those places, um, happened in the 1870s. The first uh, African American high school in DC called Dunbar. We have an area called Dunbar here too. Um, that opened. So it was a time of moving forward uh, in general for, for um, society. All right, so Worth, who I was saying he was the most famous fashion designer, he really led everything. He changed his mind, or just changed fashion, as you do. Um, and after having the bustle look, at the end of the 1870s, he completely changed things, and he made the thin, long princess dress popular. So the bustle was gone, uh, and it was just a dress that's in one piece, but it's, it's cut in panels. So it, there's no sort of waistline attaching the top and the bottom. It's, it's constructed in long panels. And on the left is a Charles Worth dress. Um, from the late 1870s. And on the right is a dress from San Francisco, you know, halfway, you know, a, a fully across the country and, you know, quite a ways a, across the world. But you can see it's almost exactly the same dress with the long line of buttons and the, the pleats and the bow in the middle sort of um, down below and then the pleats at the bottom and at the hem. So you can see his fashion really extended um, across the U.S. The princess dress, um, that was a really good Charles Worth example of one, but it was for practicality because I've been writing about real women and what they were wearing. Um, it also, you could, they, you could just make it practical and just have a plain straight dress. Um, and at the end of the 1870s, these women wore these cute little men's inspired hats too. Okay, 1880s. The 1880s clothes were tight, <laughs> really tight. <laughs> Not all of them, actually. I think it's more fair to say tailored. They were really tailored. And it was because um, one of the reasons was this woman, Alexandra of Denmark, who became the Prince of Wales and eventually became the, the um, Princess of Wales and became the Queen of England, she was adored, world, you know, Western worldwide. Um, Ladies Home J Journal called her her royal, sweet, her royal sweetness. And um, everything she wore was, was discussed. She herself was a photographer, so there were lots of photographs of her and her family available. And she uh, started, she loved the outdoors, so she started making kind of more casual, tailored fashions popular. And here's a picture of a, uh, an example of a tailored uh, suit that she wore. So yeah, tight, but really just really perfectly fitting, I should say, rather than tight. Although with these women, they're all pretty tight. Okay, other 1880s details. If you see a dress with a, a contrasting panel going straight down the middle, it was called the plastron. 
and there are buttons, little tiny buttons going, going down the middle. Um, and you can see the lady on the left is wearing one, and the lady on the left of the other picture is wearing one. That was very popular. Also, they had overskirts like they did in the 1870s, but there were really just pretty much two types. One, the short one that you see on the left, which was called drapery, and then the one on the right um, is more obvious, the right, the right picture but on the left, is called the tunic overskirt. So just those basically two, either real short or long and kind of pointed. Also, tall hats were really popular. At one point um, in California, they tried to introduce a tall hat bill because People were going to the theaters and women were wearing these tall hats and people couldn't see beyond them. So um, the hats were pretty crazy. Some of them were sort of stove pipes and some looked like upside down flower pots and some were just kind of crumpled things that sat on the top of your head. So that, that was kind of an interesting time in terms of hats. Another thing about the 1880s is in contrast to that tight tailored look, there was a movement called aesthetic or artistic dress. This started in England um, with the pre-Raphaelites way back in the 1860s, but in the 1880s, it kind of got a lot of attention in the US. And these are not very clear, but you can see it was really ridiculed because the woman on the left is like considered how you don't want to wear it, you know, baggy dress, you're kind of slouching because you're maybe not wearing a corset. And then there's some recommended ways and the one on the right is like the perfect way to wear artistic dress and it wasn't really even artistic dress. Can you tell us about corsets? Um, I'm not going to talk about corsets today, really. Um, because corsets is a really big subject. They're all, they're all different depending on what period you're looking at. Um, so sometimes they're very short, sometimes they're really long, and they basically determine the shape of the dress and of the body. Um, so I could point out when we see corsets and when they're obvious, but yeah, it's just, it's just a whole subject in itself. So, yeah. Yeah, of course, because... Oh, but you have that whole chest open. Oh, right, that would be an evening dress. Yeah, so if, if, it's, um, if it's got the chest open, it would be an evening dress, but for day-to-day -day dress, so you're talking about this one here, yeah, it's open. So even this one probably is a little open because this, is, this was a reception dress, which is kind of like an evening party dress. So yeah, if it's open, if the sleeves are short, that also probably means it's an evening dress, yeah. I don't, I, I don't think it's, as far as I remember, I don't ever remember seeing everyday dress where the woman was wearing short sleeves, unless she was a child or almost, you know, a really young teenager. Okay, so artistic dress, I think the, 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 the rebellion against it or all the bad press came, uh, came because Oscar Wilde, who is a, a, a British poet, Irish poet, um, he came to the U.S. and he did a tour of the U.S. where he talked about artistic interiors and artistic dress. And he really was, uh, you know, ahead of his time. He knew what he was talking about because he said, it's probable that the dress of the two sexes will be assimilated as similarity of costume always follows similarity of pursuits. And he also said the dress of the 20th century, and here he is in the 1880s looking forward, will emphasize distinctions of occupation, not distinctions of sex. And of course he was right. How did it translate to everyday dress? Well, this dress called the Mother Hubbard, it was worn very commonly for women doing farm work or housework, but it actually kind of came, it crept into the popular sphere, sphere where women were wearing it outside. So it's a Mother Hubbard. It's this one here where you can see it's kind of like a big smock with a square yoke and then the rest is just a loose, you know, the dress falls from, you know, sort of above the chest all the way to the ground. So it looks like the fairy tale character um, Mother Hubbard and that's why it was called that. So this um, form of dress became popular, but people really rebelled against it, pa partially because it was a favored dress for prostitutes. So um, because it was, you didn't have to wear a corset, and it was easy to take off. So um, there were a few towns in the Midwest that banned it in the 1880s, said women couldn't wear it on the streets. So I found this poem, which I love, um, so I'll quickly read it. The garment is graceful, no one can deny it, enhancing the charms of the matron and maid. Then why should those Illinois deacons decry it? Of multiple, multiplied graces, they're surely afraid. 
unlaced and unbelted, so cool and so breezy. Within its loose folds, it delights me to dwell. No garment I've worn feels so light and so easy. The sweet mother Hubbard that suits me so well. Uh, so it, you know, it wasn't that, I mean, it, it, it was popular for a few years and then afterwards it was really popular, but really if you're doing, you were doing gardening or farming or housework. Also another um, thing, sort of a carryover from aesthetic dress was the tea gown, which was a dress that women wore in the house, kind of like a bathrobe, but that wasn't a bathrobe. It was more, it was, I guess it was kind of like jogging pants of today. You'd only wear it at home. But it, um, it, it became popular for wearing outside the home in the 1880s. And you can see there's a tea gown on the right, and then on the left there's a woman wearing a dress that seems to be inspired by that tea gown look. Not tight anymore, loose. Other things that kind of were signaling that the sort of tightly corseted look might be going away or might be easing was that women started wearing sweaters or they called them jerseys. The one on the left is a silk jersey and it's stretchy material. It used to only be used for undergarments, but um, it, it became an actual garment that people would wear outside. And then on the right, there was something called a blouse waist and it was very kind of light. Now these women are wearing corsets under those garments, so it's not like they were uncorseted, but uh, at least there was this, the, the bodices aren't so heavy and thick. And the one on the left doesn't look like it's boned either. The one on the right might be boned. Women were starting to take more active roles in sport. The first women's ten, um, national singles cha tennis championship occurred in the 1880s and also amusement parks boomed. So women were going as groups, these are teenagers, but they were going as groups and they were actually getting themselves photographed in their bathing suits uh, during the 1880s. But at the end of the 1880s, the bustle had one last gasp and then it went away. And I mean the big bustle. They did have little bustles um, in, in the beginning of the early 20th century, but the big bustle where there's a huge bump on your behind, that, um, that ended in the 1880s. I thought this was kind of, this bustle is different from the one in the 1870s in that it's literally like a shelf going out over the back, your, your behind, and then it, then it drops down. Um, and the, um, there was a newspaper article where a woman had gone to a lecture by Charles Dickens' son in a church in San Francisco, and she was walking down the aisle of the church where he was talking, and she tripped, and her bustle burst. It was filled with air, and it basically burst. And that made, like, in national newspapers. And the judge in that case said, this is a most peculiar case. I have read of bustles being made of horsehair, muslin, newspapers, pillows, bird cages, and even quilts. I've heard of alarm clocks striking the hour within the folds of a lady's dress. Because they, they used to be worried that women with all these folds would be stealing stuff um, or tucking things into it. Smuggled cigars, jewelries, and brandy have also been brought to light, but I have never before heard of an airtight bustle exploding in church and being made the subject of a civil suit. Yeah. Um, well, pockets kind of went in and out. Um, th that there, we actually have a whole book on pockets here in the library if you're interested. Um, but yeah, pockets went in and out. Sometimes they were just tied into the dress. So for, for like the 1860s, there were no pockets in those dresses. Um, but uh, in the 1870s, they started to have pockets on the outside of dresses. And I guess in the 1880s, yeah, probably not so much, but hand handbags became popular. So yeah, they kind of went in and out. Um, and in, um, in, the, in the teens, the early 20th century, pockets became associated with votes, believe it or not. There's like, there, there, were, there were people who would write and they would say something about pockets, but they were actually meaning votes. So pockets became a symbol for suffrage in the, in the teens, which is, is kind of interesting. Again, it, it's, it's, we have a whole book on pockets, so that's another one that, it's a fascinating subject, fashion, fashion history. Um, all right, so I, I knew I would run out of time, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the 1890s, 
But I am going to talk about um, the Gibson girl because she was the epitome of style. She was a, a fictional character drawn by Charles Gibson, and she was either drawn, her, he either drew her or other illustrators copied her, and she represented the ideal woman. She was on everything. She was in magazines. She was in advertising. She was kind of like the, I don't know, like the, bar, well, I guess I'm dating myself, the Barbie of her day. She had different outfits. She would go to balls. She went to work. She rode bicycles. Um, she was the modern woman, and as a matter of fact, there was actually a term for the modern woman in the 1890s they were coming up to the turn of the century so they saw themselves as what they would call them as what they called fin de siècle end of the the century women and they called themselves the new woman and sometimes the new woman the press would would be negative about her um, but overwhelmingly it meant a woman who was independent um, confident might be working, was involved in charity, was going out and about. Um, that was a new woman, and her clothes, clothes in the 1890s reflected this kind of attitude towards, um, towards women's roles. One of the big things that happened in the 1890s, it might not seem that big, but I can't, under, I can't overestimate how important this was, was the bicycle. The first women's sort of drop frame bicycle with pneumatic tires was marketed in the 1890s, and it was a massive success, and it was, it was revolutionary for women. They could go places without being driven. I mean, women did drive carriages on their own before that, so it wasn't like they were totally stuck at home. But here they had just complete mobility. It was a revolution, the bicycle. And it also changed clothing. Skirts had to be shorter as a result of the bicycle. Um, women had to wear fairly tall boots to meet the skirt as a result of the bicycle. The woman on the right is kind of hard to see, but she's wearing bloomers. So she's wearing essentially puffy trousers um, to ride a bicycle so and, and a little man's cap so it was it was really important both for women's liberation but also in in changing clothing also because women were riding bicycles they didn't want fussy fussy clothing they wanted clothing that was easy to clean and easy to maintain and easy to wear so men's clothing played a big part in women's clothing in the 1890s the little men's hats the necktie, the man's collar, um, all were fashionable during that time. On the con by contrast, there were some sort of fluffy, frilly outfits. The biggest sort of hallmark of the 1890s along these lines was what they call the leg of mutton sleeve. So if you think about a big piece of ham, it's got a, it's got a, a thin bit, which is, the, which is this bit, and then it's got a fat bit, the haunch, and that's what that, this is. So it's a leg of mutton sleeve, and it was huge. It was sometimes stuffed with, um, with cotton wadding. Sometimes it was stuffed with down, um, sort of down sewed up into it, and then it all, sometimes it was even wired so that it would puff out. Um, the sleeve, the 1890s are really easy to identify clothing from because the sleeves changed every couple of years. So in 1892, they had these really tall, pointy sleeves, again, that were stuffed with um, sort of cotton batting or something like that. Um, and then mid-decade, they had the big lo leg of mutton. And then at the end of the decade, they had the puff sleeve, which was just basically a puff at the top and then a very thin um, sleeve going down. The iconic garments and where the thing that's things that everybody w w wore. I'm making so many broad generalizations. You, uh, during the l late 19th century, there was a huge divide between rich and poor. So um, I, I I make generalizations, but people invested a lot of money in clothing. So even if you were poor, um, you were still wearing a shirt waist. A shirt waist everybody wore because it could be made at home. It could be changed with the fashion. As long as you could afford fabric, um, you could make a shirt waist and, and it, if you had access to a sewing machine. Also, it was mass produced, so it was quite cheap. I think you could get them for like a dollar a piece. Um, so the shirt waist, everybody wore. And then the tailor-made suit, which is on the right, was just basically a matching jacket and skirt. Those were the iconic pieces. So everyday dress was kind of nice in the 1890s because it was more egalitarian. Everybody was wearing the same thing when it came to just sort of day-to-day -day dress. Okay, so I don't know how long I've been. Um, I'm just going to actually just ask you to test your knowledge. So when do you think this one is from? Which decade? Yeah? 1870s, you're right. 
1876. So she's got a bustle, but the one on the left is kind of going a, more of the slim line, like the princess. So yeah, 1870s. Let's have another one. Which one's this? Yeah, 1890s, we just saw that one. This one? 60s, yeah. And this one? 1880s, okay. All right, so um, I don't know if, if, if any of you need to go anywhere, please feel free. I, I'm aware with classes that people might be needing to go to a next class, so feel free to leave. But if you want to stay and share comments with me, do you know something that is interesting or that you've wondered about? Um, share info that you might know or comments or ask questions. Anyone have anything for me? Let me turn this on. Is that working? Okay, so I don't think this will make us louder, but it'll allow you to hear. Okay, so this is going to allow the um, PCC TV to hear what you're asking. Um, I'm just asking about the, the swim, the swimwear, and what fabric that is made of. Usually wool, sort of wool or alpaca. With buttons and all that? Yeah, yeah, wool, flannel, um, flannel, wool flannel or alpaca. Yeah, so people were, yeah, I mean, it's kind of, I mean, it changed a lot. That's another thing I really didn't go into, but um, it changed. It went from being basically a dress that you would wear in the ocean. Unlike, you know, sometimes you see pictures of women in Britain, like in bathing machines, where they'd actually get, a, like, driven up in this big machine to the ocean. Let's see if I can find it. Um, and then dropped off to go swimming. I don't think that was really so much of a thing. American women were a little bit more... Um, liberated but they were let's see if i can find it oh well it's right, behind right behind this one yeah i know it's the 1880s ah oh, there she is yeah so they went from dresses to what, what i would call kind of a tunic um and then shorts and then they went back to dresses but the shorts the skirts were shorter so they kind of changed throughout the decade but yeah they were usually blue red um or green and they were made of, out of flannel or alpaca. And then that or big poofy sleeved one with the doily on the top? Yeah. That's like straight out of 80s. I had a dress just like that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, fashion. See? It, like it always, you know, fashion comes. Like yeah. So five. she was saying this one here is very 1980s. There you go. And the top knot, too. Hey, that, you know, that was in fashion a few years ago, having a top knot on your head. So, yeah, it just, uh, just goes in circles. Yes, that's Courtney. I don't know if I can get that all the way back to you. I can pass. Oh, actually, I can just repeat it. That's a great question. How did they clean clothing? And um, the, the short answer is they really didn't clean them very much. So um, for a, what they, they used to have things called wash dresses, which were their everyday dresses, like maybe a Mother Hubbard that they would wear at home. And those would get cleaned with soap and water. But the, the big, you know, these kind of fancy dresses, they would mostly be sponged down. They would not be washed. As a matter of fact, my great grandmother, who's actually in one of these pictures, my mother remembered she never washed her clothes. She literally just sponged them down because they wore full sets of underwear underneath. So they had drawers, which were like long trousers, cotton trousers. They had camisoles underneath. They had on top of the camisole, they had a, what, like a little tiny blouse on top of that. Um, so it's called a corset cover. So they, they, they got dirty in their underwear. <laughs> <laughs> and then the actual outer clothing was was rarely washed. The bottom where it would tag the ground. Yeah, they would. Re they might wash it, but they would also have to replace it a lot because they were walking on streets, and obviously streets were filthy during those days. So those would get dirty, and um, yeah, I imagine they would have to wash those to a certain extent. But that they, those were regularly replaced. The bottom part of your skirt. So sometimes you'll see, um, especially like in the 1860s, you'll see. Well, I don't want to spend too much time going through, but you'll see a band that's obviously another band of, of fabric around the dress because they had to cut the bottom off and put a new, a new band on. Any other comments or questions? Yeah.
Oh, okay. I don't know about the shine, but dry cleaning, I don't know when that came in. Um, I'm guessing probably mid-century dry cleaning came in, mid-20th century. So that's basically a because probably, again, you guys probably don't do much dry cleaning, but it's basically you're, you're, you're putting chemicals on um, fabric and um, so, but uh, yeah, I think for the most part they were washing it, maybe with some kind of natural chemicals, but yeah, but no, no dry cleaning as far as, it, I know there's no dry cleaning, but whether they sometimes sent it off to somebody to be, I could imagine that happening, yeah. sending it off like you would to a dry cleaner to be especially washed. But if anyone knows anything, I always feel like when I'm here, it's me talking as if I know everything and I really don't. Um, but I, yeah, I can imagine them sending it off to get cleaned. Yeah. So you mentioned it came out like around the 70s? Yeah, in the 1870s, they yeah. became popular. What about the Egyptians? Uh, like there are sculptures of Egyptians before that who had handbags. Yeah. Sculptures. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. Yeah, so it's not as if they were invented. It's just that in terms of American everyday fashion, the 1870s was when handbags started to come in. And by the 1880s, I think we've got a picture of someone with a handbag. They were really popular because women were going out and about. They couldn't really um, do without a handbag. So let's see if I can find my, she is, let's see, I think she's here. Nope, sorry guys, I just wanna show you. Yeah, so the, both these women have handbags or purses, I guess you can call them. Yeah, in the 1880s, there was a fashion for curvy women. So I think because people were better, you know, had better nutrition. Um, but in 1880s, let's see if I've got that one. There is a woman, she's by no means overweight, she's thin, but just that kind of curvy look rather than the skinny look, that, that came in. Also, if you think about it, there was a lot of exposure to actresses and uh, from the stage at that point the, they were they were mass selling pictures of actresses in like tobacco stores and so you had these women who were on the stage who were a little bit sort of more voluptuous let's say and so that was considered sexy so in the 1880s um, actually I think um, there was I, I had a quote in the book something about how um, a skinny woman and happiness in a home never dwell together because if she's skinny she's unhappy so um, yeah so being too skinny started to be frowned upon in the 1880s so they, didn't wear bras. they wore corsets and then they would wear something like what I would call I think they might have called them a bust improver where they would wear something like around a, a, a like a bra but it wasn't a bra with straps so it's basically a corset with, with another piece of fabric that would be around their, their bust. Any other questions or comments? Okay, well thank you for your attention guys. I've got some photographs on the table, so if you actually want to see real 19th century photographs, they're here on the table. Um, and if you want to, if someone wants to borrow the book, there's one that someone can borrow from the library and there's also one that people can page through if they want.